Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt where we read better, not more. Today is Thursday and we are continuing our discussion of the Song of Roland. And uh, I wanted to get at least to the point where Roland died and oh my gosh, that's such a long death. Such a long death scene. It took like three pages. Anyway, but before we get to there, which was the end of my reading, we do get the announcement of the Spanish lords and their troops. And this really reminded me of like the catalog of the ships in it, the Iliad. Very similar kind of feel of like who was the captain for this particular, you know, contingent of soldiers. Where are they from? A little sh schmur about them. Schmur is not a real word. Don't use that in your papers. When Oliver sees the huge Spanish force, he asks Roland to blow his horn to call back the full force of Charlemagne. And of course, Roland refuses because he's a big idiot. No, he's just very brash and very bold. And also, he's a huge idiot. And here we see the use of repetition. This conversation happens, I think, twice and almost identical with slightly different refrains. And we saw it once before when Ganelon and Marsilian were discussing Charlemagne and there was this repetition of this idea of like, well, how strong of a king is Charlemagne if he's 200 years old? But the structure of repetition of these stanzas really gets back to that this would have been a ballad sort of performed in a public matter somewhere between singing and chanting and telling and that it would have had, you know, these opportunities for sort of like audience participation where repeated, stan repeated stanzas they would have possibly like participated in as well. And then there's like this indication that there's this AOI word that occurs at, a, at the end of a whole bunch of the stanzas and that that possibly would have been like a, a refrain like, hey oh or hey, you know, at the end of, uh, of a section. The other thing that it does like from a literary standpoint is I think it really increases the plot tension where we have like this, this debate between Marsilian and Gan Ganelon. Is that their names? Yeah. So we have this debate between Marsilian and Ganelon and Marsilian is sort of like this unstable king, like he, will, he could kill him on the spot. And so when they're going back and forth and he's trying, you have this sense of like, oh, is he going to like really pull the javelin and really throw it at him? Or like, what's going to happen? What's the outcome here? And the same thing happens in this conversation between Oliver and Roland where it's like, please, you know, blow the horn, like call for aid. Like you're not going to make it through this battle. And we, as the audience know it, and we are like building the tension into that event. Roland's brash desire for a fight is so over the top that he sort of, he actually really reminds me of the Black Knight from Monty Python. <laughs> He even says something like he sees like the 100,000 men that are facing his troops of 20,000 and he goes, oh, I wish there were more, you know, it's merely a flesh wound. It's like always gunning for a fight. They get absolved before going into battle and absolution is actually uh, really important. We saw it with Gamelon before he went to be the peace traitor representative when he went to Marsilian and betrayed everybody. The idea that you would get all of your sins absolved from uh, your entire life up until that point. One, because they're going into battle to murder people. Although, of course, it's like this holy battle, so I'm not exactly sure theologically where that lies in terms of sin. But, you know, in the Catholic tradition, there's this tradition of purgatory, which is that all of your sins have literal and practical consequences that go out into the world like on a day-to-day -day basis. When you do something that's wrong, it, it's, it's gonna affect yourself and it's gonna affect the people around you. But there's also like spiritual consequences that need to be accounted for. And you would do that through the use, through purgatory is basically paying off that sin debt in purgatory. With absolution, uh, you would basically be absolved of those sins. And so that time would be taken off of your time in purgatory, I think. I'm not Catholic, so people in the comment section can correct me if I'm wrong there. So this idea of absolution before going into this major event would have been really important. Uh, the seats for the second half of the battle are set before the battle even begins. We have this reference to this idea that Charlemagne needs to revenge them, that something bad's going to happen here and Charlemagne is going to follow up with Marsilian and Marsilian isn't going to get away with his treachery. Each French hero is sort of given his first blow. 
And I, the text is so orderly, not just in form, not just in its sort of perfunctory and pragmatic and straightforward style, but even in moments like this where we have, and this Lord, and Oliver, and this Lord, and this Lord, and this Lord, and of course they're very successful, and they're these really great warriors. But on the flip side, we see that the Spanish troops are very powerful warriors as well, which they have to be to be able to compete, complete the storyline as it needs to be completed. But it also means that like a victory isn't worth very much if your opponent isn't very good. I really like the fight scenes. I like them in the Iliad too. I like epic poetry for like the action scenes and the fight scenes quite a bit. I think that's one of the reasons why I like the Iliad better than the Odyssey. There's like not very good fight scenes in the Odyssey, let's be honest. There's a big storm at the end of sort of like the first battle round. And I think it sort of represents this chaos that things are out of order and that Charlemagne has to execute revenge to restore proper order. And then the betrayal of Ganelon is revealed like completely right after that. When the French are down to like 60 men, now Roland considers blowing his horn, his oliphant, as it's called in the text, which I think, first of all, I like elephants. Second of all, I think oliphant is a really cute word. And thirdly, I like it. That's my analysis of that. You're welcome. But <laughs> Oliver points out that it's like not a very noble thing to blow your horn when the only person left to be saved is like your own skin and that of like your best friends. It's like, maybe you should have blown the horn earlier when I said so. And Oliver does have a little bit of a, like I told you so kind of <laughs> attitude, I feel like, but like, fair enough, they're about to die. And this conversation is again repeated. And Roland doesn't understand, even as he comes to the end of his life, even as like all of his companions are like falling on the war on the battlefield around him, how his rashness got him into this mess with only 60 men left. Again, we have this really strong sense of xenophobia. It increases when we see there's a particular lord or contingent of forces. His name is Marganis, and he has literally African men in his force and the way that they're described is like for a modern reader it's like ooh, we don't say those things but it's this pretty strong xenophobic language and it really speaks again to these heightened tensions between people groups this political instability this livelihood instability it's like it's rough to hear people speaking so uh in such a distasteful way, an ungracious way around about one another. It's very painful, I would say, for a modern reader to read. So that got me through to the end of the death of Roland. And now the next portion of the story, I think, is going to be the fulfillment of Charlemagne completing this revenge quest um, on his 20,000 troops that were lost, on Roland and Oliver and all these great lords who were lost in the battle as well. So should be really fun. One thing that was really interesting to read about, my hair is still so messed up. Oh well, this is, this is where I'm at at this stage of COVID. It's pretty acceptable. We're going with acceptable. This idea that the story should have ended just with the death of Roland, but, uh, and she disagreed. And I, I, I think I agree with, um, the, the lady who wrote the introduction. It must've been Dorothy L. Sayers. The story does feel incomplete with the death of Roland because, again, it's not about necessarily Roland as a champion, even though he is sort of our main character, has been the focus of our, especially this conflict between uh, Roland and his stepfather, Ganelon, has been of focus so far. But we know that the whole thing was really set up as this holy religious battle. This is the time, like, le leading into the Crusades, like, the Crusades are just about to kick off. So this spirit of the cross versus the crescent, Christianity versus the Muslim faith, is really, really of core importance to the people of Europe at this time. So I think the story is incomplete because it's not actually just about Roland and his conflict. The conflict is actually greater, and it's about Charlemagne as the representative of like the Christian God completing his defense of the Christian faith in this multicultural, multi-religious world. So... That's what I've got for you today. Until next time, my name is Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile.